we have seen two models for population growth. The exponential growth, where a population can continue increasing without limit, doubling population size at a shorter and shorter time interval. But we've also seen a more realistic uh, logistic growth in which a population has limits, and those limits are going to be imposed by the environment resources such as water and food and shelter, space, mates, uh, just to name a few. But I want to focus a little bit on precisely what are factors that can limit population growth. These can usually be classified into two groups, density-dependent factors and density-independent factors. Let's begin by paying attention to what we call the density dependent factors. These are going to be those that are the result of overcrowding. Usually when there are too many members of a population in a limited space, these kinds of factors are going to limit population size to a point that it may even drive a population down uh, to a crashing point. Let's see specifically what these can be. Number one, overcrowding, too many members in the population, will lead to the use of all the food, the water may be used up, but may also be contaminated with the wastes of the animal. This increased waste production is a problem because waste can be a harbor for a vector for diseases of a bacterial nature, uh, fungus, and many, many other kinds of decomposers that not only use uh, and get energy from the waste, but can also move over to a host like a living animal or plant. Because now we're looking at agents of disease like uh, bacteria and fungi, there can also be disease outbreaks. And if you look at this picture, this is a photo taken in Australia where they have had problems with rabbits which were introduced. And there's been times in the history of uh, people living in Australia where there's so many of these rabbits, they use up or they eat up all the food. You can see no plants left around here. There's a little puddle of water and all of these animals drinking water in such close proximity to one another will make it real easy for diseases to go from one to the next one. Parasites like uh, fleas and ticks and mites, like the one you see here in this picture, not only are they a bother, a nuisance to animals that have these external parasites, but they can also decline the health and cause other kinds of infections, which usually can result in death uh, unless the par parasites are eliminated. So look at all of these problems that can happen because of overcrowding. This is why we call these density dependent factors. The more dense, the more overcrowded the population is, the more severe these factors are going to be and the more likely the population will be going down. This is exactly what happened to the story I told you about these uh, 26 reindeer that were introduced to St. Paul Island in Alaska. At first, there was plenty of space and plenty of water and food for 26 reindeer. But as the numbers began to go up to 500 of them, now the population began doubling in such a short amount of time. In just one year, the population were almost double. And by the late 1930s, the population had reached 2,000 reindeer. And by then, these animals had eaten just about all of the plants that are available for these animals to obtain their nutrition. And what followed immediately was a population crash. The numbers went down and continued to go down and uh, until there was only a very few, a handful uh, number of survivors. And so that's what density dependent factors can do. Here, sadly for the reindeer, instead of the population stabilizing around a carrying capacity, the population actually crashed. And this is why I really like to talk about population ecology to my classes is because we are part of a population, we're part of a human population that for decades, increased in an exponential fashion. And now we're seeing the consequences of rapid human population growth in the form of climate change, in the form of famine and disease spreading in many parts of the world. This is not a global kind of a thing, but it's going to be mostly localized in places where 
there is poor sanitation, limited food, and uh, there are many other problems that are resulting in high mortality rates for, like I said, human populations in certain parts of the world. And that is devastating. I mean, that is heartbreaking when you see those cases. Uh, they happen in Latin America, they happen in Africa, it happens in India and Pakistan and Bangladesh, just to name a few of these places where mortality as a result of low food, high uh, numbers of uh, disease, uh, uh, people who carry diseases and how they are spreading them to other members of the population. Uh, but let's continue exploring here because this concept of density dependent factors is also responsible for population cycles. And these cycles sometimes are described as boom and bust. Take a look, for example, at the animals in this picture. Here you see uh, the relative of rabbits and, and uh, hares. This is known as a snowshoe hare. And here you see the predator, which is a lynx, an animal that looks real similar to the bobcats uh, we can find in the Pacific Northwest. Many people look at this type of situation and probably will be cheering for the rabbit. Come on, go, hurry, snowshoe hare. Don't get caught by the bad kitty because many people see nature this way, like predators are evil and the prey are innocent, uh, harmless members of a community. And a lot of it has to do with movies we've seen since we were little, like Walt Disney movies and Lion King and all of these other <laughs> stories that we've seen and really give you the wrong, completely wrong impression of how nature really works. So let me tell you about these two animals. If you look at this graph, you can see that the snowshoe hare populations go through cycles where they really increase in numbers and then they crash. And then about 10 years later, the population goes up again and then it crashes again. And the population goes up 10 years later and then it crashes again. Scientists, people who observe nature, also noticed that lynx population went up following an increase in the snowshoe hare. Well, this makes sense because the lynx population is limited by the abundance of prey. If there's a large number of prey, then lynx populations will go up. But what happened when the snowshoe hare population goes down? The lynx population also goes down. Because of this mistaken understanding of nature, at first, people thought that it was the intensity of the predator, it was a bad kitty, and how many snowshoe hares they were, eat, they were eating that was driving the snowshoe hare population down. But a careful study of the dynamic between these two populations revealed that it this doesn't matter, it didn't matter how many of these predators, how many lynx were present in the environment, that was not the cause of the decline for the snowshoe hares. The snowshoe hare population is not controlled by predators, but it's actually controlled by their own food supply. So you see, as the snowshoe hare population went through a population boom, they got to numbers where they ate all of their plant supply, and when there were no more plants to eat, their own population crashed. And the sad thing here is that not only did the snowshoe hare ship went down, but going down with that ship was also the population of lynx, which time after time, following the exploitation of plant resources by the snowshoe hare and their following population crash, the lynx population also went down. And this is one important lesson people who study predators and prey will tell you about. Predators are never responsible for the extinction of any prey species because the moment prey numbers begin to go down immediately, predator numbers are also going to go down. And so, um, it's just, you know, for me, it's interesting to see how these dynamics play out and how uh, now you understand these are going to be connected by density dependent factors. Density independent factors are usually going to be abiotic in nature. Abiotic meaning not living or not alive. These factors are usually going to be related to environmental phenomena, weather patterns floods and droughts can wipe out a large population or a small population. It has nothing to do with population density. These factors are effective and they're usually of a random nature. 
Like we can never really tell exactly when there's going to be a year with uh, severe flooding like what we're seeing this year over in the um, Midwest part of the United States uh, where rivers are reaching historical high levels. Uh, the Missouri River in particular is creating a lot of trouble for certain towns uh, in the states of um, Missouri and uh, others nearby. Extreme colder heat is going to be another factor that can destroy populations or, or limit, curve off their size, drive numbers down. Uh, and this is what happens with these animals called aphids, little green insects you can see growing, um, I'm sorry, living, feeding on uh, the sap produced by the leaves of plants. Uh, you go outside any front yard and you look carefully at the plants, you likely will find aphids at this time of the year. But then what happens is in many parts of the world where you have a real summer, not like the ones here in Seattle, summers are so mild, but a place where it really gets hot, following the spring months, where there's an abundance of water and food and mild climate, when summer comes and weather gets dire and temperatures go really high, it is that increase in temperature that is going to drive the aphid populations down. The animals basically dry out in the intense summer heat that we can see in many parts of the world, including here in the United States. Fires, wildfires can be devastating to both large populations, small populations, dense populations or populations at low density, regardless, all can suffer from these uh, events. And of course, human disturbance. Human disturbance, disturbance in the form of uh, deforestation, in the form of um, urbanization, the, the expansion of uh, urban developments in many places where there used to be natural communities. And the populations that used to be there present uh, will be affected regardless of their density. And so now that we understand better about you know, these factors that limit population size, now we can apply them to understand better how exponential growth and logistic growth can be um, used for exploring how populations can increase, stay the same, or decrease over time.